morning. I hope you are awake and ready to go. Okay, four of you are. That's great. Hey, I uh, hope you've had a great week. I know the weather's making a little turn for us. And it's nice to have a little sunshine, a little vitamin D. And uh, just to feel better about life and where things are going. And this week I have just been reminded so much of how fragile this life really is. It's had some events to come up that just um, have just been such a stark reminder, a reality of our mortality. And so as you're coming in this morning and, and you are expecting to hear a few songs and a message and uh, a prayer at the end and an offering and a uh, time to leave this place, I pray that you would just be completely open to whatever God speaks to your heart and mind. I pray that you would not just come in and listen to the music this morning, but that you would just try to have a time being alone with God. That He might hear your heart. That He might understand better where you're coming from and that you do love Him and you do worship Him and you do want a better relationship with Him. For you see in this series we're doing and sharing and talking about Samson in the beginning of how God is going to begin to use him to overtake the Philistines that someone else will have to come in and finish it. You know, last week we talked about how we might have to be a part of something we'll never get to see come to fruition. But that's okay. Because in society, we're supposed to be the one to get it done. Because if Larry the Cable Guy were standing right here, what would he say to you? <laughs> get her done. You're supposed to start it, finish it, get her done. But it might be that we are supposed to have a part in it and not the whole thing. So we must do everything we can to stay on track. And I think the more that we read and study and look at the life of Samson, that we all have a little Samson in us. If I said, would you agree with me, raise your hand, I would hope that everybody would raise their hand. Okay, some of you don't. So. Uh, some of you are just tired, you don't feel like raising your hand. Listen, he was able, God was able to use him, and he was able to do some things for God, some amazing things. But many times, they weren't motivated initially by pleasing God and allowing God to use it. And we're going to see that today, that that's where he had some struggles. You may be sitting out there this morning, and maybe you're here for the first time visiting. Maybe you just want to check out this whole thing about what being a Christian is all about. Maybe you're... Not a Christian. That's completely cool. I'm just thankful you're here to hear what we're about and hear what the Bible says. And then you make your own decision. But this morning, I think we're going to see that God is able to use those who struggle in spite of themselves. If I shared with you right now that your pastor struggles, some of you may collectively go, oh, I can't believe that. And some of you may go, no, I know it. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping that wouldn't be the reaction. I was hoping to stay quiet while I did that. But we're real here at Cross Point Church. Amen. So we're going to begin looking in Judges, the book of Judges, chapter 14. And there's so much information I want to get to you this morning. There are so many verses, but we need them all. Because I want to, <laughs> this is going to sound a little crazy based on what I just did. I want to be able to finish what I started here this morning in chapter 14. So let's go ahead and look there right now. 
Bible says this. One day when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. Problem. Automatic. Problem right there. Because who were his enemies? Philistine. Problem. When he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timna caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. <laughs> kind of like a kid saying, hey, I'm going to be 16 next year. Am I getting a Mustang or a Camaro? You're getting a 75 Hornet wagon. <laughs> Orange paint and wood grain paneling on it. I must say, I look good in it, too, by the way. <laughs> Get her for me. He didn't say, what are your thoughts on this girl? What, what do you think about that relationship? What, how would that go with our family? Would she fit in? He said, Get her for me. Verse 3, his father and mother objected. Anybody over the age of 30 who had your parents object to somebody, raise your hand, hands down. How many of you went on anyway? I'm not going to ask the next question because she might be sitting beside you now. <laughs> so, so, they objected. Isn't there even one woman in our tribe or among all the Israelites you could marry? They asked, why must you go to the pagan Philistines to find a wife? He's saying, you got all these options, all these things that would be pleasing to God. Why must you go down that road? To kind of put that where we are now, you might just say, you did not just go there. No, you did not. We are not doing that. All these options, and, that, and that's what you're going to do? But Samson told his father, get her for me. Mm. It's time for a rod or a timeout, sounds like. <laughs> An adult timeout. Because then there's what he says next. She looks good to me. Problem. His father and mother didn't realize the Lord was at work in this, creating an opportunity to work against the Philistines who ruled over Israel at that time. Now, I'm going to stop right here because you need to understand that the Lord is not going to ask you to do something wrong in order to do something right. Did you get that? The Lord is not going to ask you to do something wrong so that he can do something right. The Lord knew what he was going to do. He knew what his choice was going to be. But he was going to be at work in it anyway. So don't say, well now, I've got an excuse. I can go do this because I know the Lord wants to bless my sin. Does that even make sense? No. So, but the Lord was going to work in it anyway. So verse 5, as Samson and his parents were going down to Timnah, a young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the vineyards of Timnah. At that moment, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him, and he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. He did it as easily as if it were a young goat. If you've ever ripped the jaws from a young goat, you know how easy that is. <laughs> so he's pretty strong, right? But he didn't tell his father or mother about it. When Samson arrived in Timnah, he talked with the woman and was very pleased with her. Right there. When he stops and talks to her, and he's pleased with her. We're going to stop right there and just 
share a couple of things you need to understand in this whole thing that's transpired. One, it started out, he was just on the fringe of something maybe he shouldn't have done, he shouldn't do. Timno was just right there on the fringe, he's right there sort of in between, right on the line, if you will. So he was just kind of peering in and going, oh yeah, wow, she looks good. That's who I want. So our first issue is, you're trying to do God's will and you're trying to be used of God. Know where you are. Know where you are. You know what he's wanting to do in your life. You know how you're supposed to live. You know what he desires that you complete as a task on this earth as a follower of Christ. Know where you are. When you get over to the edge, it's much more tempting. When you get over to the edge, it's much, much easier to fall off. So that's where he was. He was flirting with it. He knew where he was, but he didn't care. So know where you are. Secondly, he let this lust come into his heart. And he looks out and he sees this girl. And he did not share with his parents. She is a woman after God's own heart. She's attractive. She's very friendly. She comes from a nice area and home. He says, she looks good to me. She looks good to me. And then he says, go get her for me. So his parents said, what? Is there not somebody else you could go and find in all of Israel, in all of our area right here? There's got to be one person. No, that's who I want. They objected. So the second thing you need to know is heed godly counsel. How many times, how many times have we had someone speak to us and say, this is what you need to know. I don't think I would do that. And you say, I think it'll be all right. Anybody? Me? I don't, I don't know if that's, that's the direction you ought to go because that's, that's going to be trouble right there. I believe it'll be okay. I, I really do. Because every time, every time, don't heed godly counsel, there are consequences. Every time. So then on the way to Timnah, when they were going down there, a young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the vineyards of Timnah. He had taken the Nazarite vow to not be around wine or grapes or any of that, and so where does he find himself? In the vineyard. Is that doing what he's supposed to do? No, a lion attacks him, becomes very strong. The spirit of the Lord came upon him. With his bare hands, takes it apart. <coughs> so now, verse 8. Later, when he returned to Timnah for the wedding, he turned off the path to look at the carcass of the lion. He scooped some of the honey into his hands and ate it along the way. He also gave some to his father and mother, and they ate it. But he didn't tell them he had taken the honey from the carcass of the lion. As his father was making final arrangements for the marriage, Samson threw a party at Timnah, as was the custom for elite young men. When the bride's parents saw him, they selected 30 young men from the town to be his companions. Did anybody just get that? <clears throat> he is selecting a pagan girl to be his wife. His parents objected to, 
who is an enemy of the people, the very people he is going to begin to deliver his people from. And he's so bent on having her that when he goes down into the wedding, he doesn't even have any friends to go be a part of the feast. So the bride's parents had to get some friends for him. Hey, we're having a party. Would you guys like to come? Dude does not have a friend one. Just come kind of hang out. So he's in the midst of this enemy, but he's got the girl. He's got the girl. He got what he wanted. His parents gave in. He got what he wanted. As parents, is it easy to say no? No. Is it easy to watch your children make decisions you know are not going to be good and they make them anyway? No. But they said, okay, big boy, you're going to have to learn about this on your own. And so the parents got his 30 friends from town. And Samson is feeling a little bit too cocky right here. You know, he's in the midst of this feast and this party now all the time knowing that God's going to use him to begin to deliver the Israelites from the hand of the enemy here, but he's in the midst of it. And so he's thinking, I, I pretty well got this, and I got the girl too. So he's saying, you know, I ripped that lion's jaws apart, ate that honey. This would be pretty funny. I don't know these guys. Let me just throw a little riddle at them and say, hey, guys, i got a joke for you. So you know when somebody comes up to you and they say, have you ever heard the one about it's either going to be funny or what? Mm -hmm. mm. You fake a little something and you walk off, right? You know, I got this joke for you, or as we do in our home all the time, knock, knock. Ooh. And some doozies. But he says, I've got one for you right here, guys. He says to them, verse 12, let me tell you a riddle. If you solve my riddle during these seven days of the celebration, I will give you 30 Fine linen robes. He knows they're not going to get it. He knows it's over their head. He's the only one that knows about the lion. And 30 sets of festive clothing. But if you can't solve it, then you must give me 30 fine linen robes and 30 sets of festive clothing. All right. There's 30 of us. All right, they agreed. Let's hear your riddle. So here's what he says. And I love the word. If you're not in the word, get in the word because you can't make this up. This is, this is what it says. Out of the one who eats came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Did you hear that? But now, if you didn't know anything about that, let's think about that. Out of the one who eats came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. That drives you crazy. Do you have anything like that that drives you crazy? One of the things that drives me crazy, and don't do this to me because I will be not happy, is somebody goes, Preacher, did you hear about what... Never mind, I, I really, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> or, or we'll be going down the road, and the one of the kids, Renee, will say, you know, did you hear that? I'll just tell you later. And I'm like, no, give it to me. <laughs> tell me. Don't wait. I hate that. I hate that. So these guys have this. And I think, okay. Yeah, something sweet, huh? So for three days of this seven-day feast, this celebration, they're 
They're trying to figure it out. And they can't. So they get frustrated. And so, not being very godly people, not being very godly people, they go to his wife. Verse 15. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband to explain the riddle for us, or we will burn down your father's house with you in it. <clears throat> Tell us the riddle, because we can't pay for all that. We can't do all that. We're going to burn down your father's house with you in it. They said, entice him. Husbands and wives shouldn't have to entice and try to pull something out. They should be on the same page. But you see right here, Samson got himself in this situation because he didn't, third thing, stay humble. Stay humble. Know where you are. Heed godly counsel. Stay humble. He got a little bit too big for his. I love this county. You yeah, don't know what preachers are, do you? There you go. All right. Daniel's on it right here. He says, did you invite us to, to this party just to make us poor? So let me get this straight. You invited us here just to make fun of us and make us poor. Is that what you did? Because it was her parents that got the 30 guys to come and be his friend. So... Here's where the drama starts. So Samson's wife came to him in tears and said, You don't love me, you hate me. Well, there you go. Those are the words in a marriage that always get a dialogue started. You don't love me? You did, you clean the kitchen. You're right, I don't love you. I'm watching the ball game. Sorry. <laughs> It was good, though. Thanks for cooking it. <laughs> but the ma manipulation started even here. She said, you don't love me. You hate me. And he's like, what? You lost your mind? She's got the waterworks going. She says, you don't love me. You hate me. You have given my people a riddle. But you haven't told me the answer. Now, right there, you have given my people the answer. See, had he known where he was on this journey, he went up to the edge and just saw the outskirts. He saw in Timna this girl that caught his eye. Then he ventured on in a little more. Then he wants to marry her. Then he's there. Now he's among the people in the center center of this whole mess because of pride and arrogance and selfishness. Saying, I bet they can't get it. And so they began to use her. And he says, hey, I haven't even given the answer to my father or mother. Why should I tell you? So she cried whenever she was with him. Dear heaven. Seven-day celebration. She gets threatened on day four, and from then on, she's crying the whole time. <laughs> no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Ladies, I'm being a little bit facetious there, so but it's because her husband's being so mean. That's what it is, right? Amen? Amen. All right. So they have this drama game going to see if he's going to give in. So she cried whenever she was with him and kept it up for the rest of the celebration. 
Congratulations on your marriage, on your wedding. Thank you. The whole time, the Bible says the whole time, every time she was around him, anybody else, she's crying. That's a bad sign. That's not a good start. That is not a good start. <coughs> At last, on the seventh day, he told her the answer because she was tormenting him with her nagging. Ow. She was tormenting him with her nagging. And I am so thankful for all the awesome women in our church. I know this is never even an issue. So, I'm serious. We've got good, godly women here. I get extra points for that. <coughs> but she just really, she stayed on him, stayed on him, stayed on him, stayed on him. And he gave her the answer. And then she explained it to the young men. So they finally got to her because realistically, was she crying because of what Samson was doing or what he was saying? No, she was crying to get him to tell the answer because she was going to die with her dad. She had a legitimate something to be crying about. And she was nagging and tormenting because she knew what her fate was going to be because they didn't play. So she was in a predicament. We had a little fun with that, but she was in a predicament. She had to say, listen, you've got to let me know. My, what a little humility would have done to change this whole scenario. So before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town came to Samson with their answer. What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? In the form of a question. And I guess they got it right, and I guess that may be where they came up with jeopardy, why you have to answer a question, I don't know. <laughs> what is sweeter than honey? Correct. What is stronger than a lion? Correct. And here's where Samson laid it down on. He said, I know you wouldn't have got it. This is probably the least quoted verse of scripture in the Bible. <laughs> Just say it. Just say it. <laughs> I'm telling you, it, the Bible is good. Stay in it. It's funny. It's good. But Samson's fired up and he says, if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have solved the riddle. <laughs> now, it doesn't say what she did, because I'm sure she was standing beside of him at some point. If you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have solved my riddle. I need to give a disclaimer right here. Do not try this at home. <laughs> Because in preparing, I told Renee, I said, I just want you to know, nobody's going to plow with my heifer. <laughs> it didn't go over good as I thought it was going to. <laughs> but what he was saying was, if you had not manipulated my wife, if you had not just bulldozed her, powered through her, threatened her, you would never have gotten this. See, if we think about that marriage in the terms of a farm analogy that they are yoked together pulling, and he would never have given them that riddle answer, they manipulated her to get her to pull and plow in a direction he would never have gone. Thus the term, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have solved this riddle. And guys, I'm going to tell you right now, you need to protect your wife. You need to take care of her. Because things happen, things are said all the time that she probably never even shares with you. You man up and be a man and tell people, hey, don't mess with my wife. 
she's mine. You don't treat her that way because I don't. But had they not threatened to burn her father's house and her in it, they would never have gotten her. So here, finally, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to the town of Ashkelon, killed 30 men, took their belongings, and gave their clothing to the men who had solved the riddle. But Samson was furious about what had happened, and he went back home to live with his father and mother. So in order to settle this wager that he created, this thing that he brought on himself, he had to go kill 30 men, strip them down, give their belongings to these other 30. Now, they were the enemy. And that may have been the beginning of him getting that where it needed to be. But look at how we got to that point. And then he had to go back home to live with his father and mother. And I wonder what they said when he came back home. I heard it from over here. I don't know if that's what they said. I told you so. Or sometimes we like to go, what did I say? That always is uplifting to your children whenever they're already feeling bad for making a bad decision. And, well, I tried to tell you. We don't listen. We have to be shown sometimes. And I heard one lady used to say when I worked in the school system back when corporal punishment was the real deal. You didn't have the behavior like you got now. She used to say, well, listen, if you can't listen, you're going to have to feel. Your choice. No, that's what I'm talking about right there. So he didn't listen, so now he's having to feel. And in verse 20, get this. So his wife was given in marriage to the man who had been Samson's best man at the wedding. You talk about a bad week. That seven day feast was a bad week. So when you say, I've had a bad week this week, think about Samson. <laughs> That's a long seven days. And four of those days, on the, from the fourth day on, they're just crying, carrying on, drama, to get to this place. See, God can use us even when we make those decisions that aren't good. He still used Samson at the end. As we're going to get to and see later on when we finish this up, he still he uses him anyway. But listen, we want to be on the same page with God. We don't want to hear, well done, but if we'd been tracking a little better, what could we have done? We don't want to hear, well done, but man, if we could have got on the same page, what could we have done? And that's what we see here this morning. So know where you are on your faith journey. How closely are you walking with the Lord? Heed godly counsel. Stay humble. Stay humble. And finally, stay focused. Stay focused. Because you see at the very end, when he had to pay that debt, he lost complete focus. Left, went and killed the 30 men to pay the debt, and then just went back home to mom and dad, and basically having to start over. So when we follow those steps and we stay in tune with where God is, He can use us. Are we perfect? No. Am I perfect? No. Will I ever be? No. Will you ever be? No. Not until our passing. And we are finally free. We're spending eternity in a holy and righteous heaven. That sin cannot be present in. Only then will we have it all together. 
where we can make better decisions. We can try to focus on where God wants us to go, what God wants us to do. And when you have that gut feeling of, I don't know about this. And you have godly counsel that says, you know what? Run. Run. Students, young people, I'm telling you, the mature people in the audience are not telling you that to keep you from having fun. They're not telling you that to cause you a problem. They're telling you that because they probably didn't heed their parents' counsel either. Amen? Amen. Because when you hit a certain age, you know more than your parents. And then when you hit another age, they are absolute geniuses. You might say, not mine. Yeah, 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 I don't want to ever say that. Oh, yeah, you will. And then you will go and apologize to your parents for not listening more when you were a kid, when your kids are doing exactly what you did. Amen. you like, I wish I listened more. They're just like me. They have to have the last word. I don't want to hear another word. Okay. <laughs> I said, that's it. All right. Mm. Mm. I said, that, that is the last. I'm having the last word. Okay. Mm. Mm. That's me. That, that was me. My mama used to just have to body slam me sometimes. So, but heed that God that counts. will know where you are on that journey. And let's do some amazing things. He wants to use you no matter how broken, no matter how messed up, no matter how much junk in your trunk. Jesus paid it off. It's covered. Let's just move forward. We can't go back. You can't change it. You can't change the past if we could. Man, I got a lot of stuff I'd want to get cleaned up. It all got cleaned up on that cross. We just try to live each day. So as a church, let's move forward. See what we can do about getting our own relationship with Christ individually where it needs to be so that as a church we can further the kingdom and make a huge difference in heaven one day.